the reactivity of carbonyl containing compounds. Specifically, we're going to talk about aldehydes and ketones. And if we take a look at uh, this diagram here, where we have uh, maybe a ketone or an aldehyde, but we have our carbonyl group, you'll also notice that we have a hydrogen attached to the alpha carbon. So there's several different types of reactivity uh, that we can see here. The oxygen is a basic site and it can uh, be protonated by uh, strong acids, uh, fairly decent acids. The carbon is an electrophilic site and it can be attacked by uh, nucleophiles. The hydrogen on the alpha carbon is an acidic hydrogen, so that proton can be removed by uh, strong bases. And when that happens, this carbon then becomes nucleophilic. So we can think of this carbon as a potentially nucleophilic site. We're going to be talking specifically in this module about the electrophilic reactivity of the carbonyl carbon and what happens when it gets attacked by a nucleophile. So again, this is just an electrostatic potential map that's showing you the electrophilicity of the carbonyl carbon, the basicity and potential nucleophilicity of the carbonyl oxygen, and the acidity of any protons that are on the alpha carbon. We also want to remember that the carbonyl carbon is sp2 hybridized and is thus trigonal planar. Uh, so that comes into play when we think about a nucleophile approaching uh, it can approach either from this side or from the bottom side. So let's talk about the bonding and we're going to simplify and look at the bonding in formaldehyde. So uh, we have uh, a carbon-carbon bond due to the overlap of the sp2 hybrid orbitals, that's our sigma bond. Because each of these is sp2 hybridized, there's a pl orbital left over uh, in that carbon and that oxygen. And it's those p orbitals that can overlap in a pi fashion to form our pi bond. So this is a good valence bond description for the bonding in a carbonyl group. If we take, think about the electrons that are there in uh, the carbonyl group then, uh, we have our carbon-carbon pi bond. That turns out is not the highest occupied molecular orbital, but it's the highest occupied molecular orbital minus one, our HOMO minus one. The n orbitals that have those lone pairs of electrons in the oxygen are the highest occupied molecular orbitals. In the valence bond description, we think of them as being degenerate and of the same energy level. And then we have our pi star orbital, which is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, and this is the orbital that's responsible for interacting with a filled orbital in a nucleophile. So the highest occupied molecular orbital in a nucleophile uh, can interact with this empty orbital, the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital in our carbonyl group. Instead of a valence bond description, if we go to uh, molecular orbital descriptions, we get a similar picture. There's a couple of uh, minor differences here. One uh, being that we no longer have degenerate n orbitals. Uh, that is, on the oxygen, we don't have two lone pairs that are the same orbital. What we see is we have uh, an n orbital. This is it over here, uh, different picture. These are the same things, but it's an n orbital. It has a pair of electrons in it, and it has a lot of density on the oxygen atom. Below that is our pi orbital. Uh, and so we see that the n and the pi orbitals have the same energy levels. The, this would be the HOMO, and this would be the HOMO minus 1. And our pi star orbital is an unoccupied molecular orbital, the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, and it has a very large lobe on the carbonyl carbon. So it's very similar, but down here, uh, 
Below the sigma bond, we see the other n orbital. Uh, so the molecular orbital description is a little bit different, but in terms of its reactivity, we can still see the highest occupied molecular orbital is an n-like orbital on the oxygen. And that's responsible for the basicity of the oxygen atom in a carbonyl group. Uh, and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital is this pi orbital. And that is responsible for the electrophilicity of the carbonyl carbon. Again, we have to remember that a carbonyl is, a, the carbon is sp2 hybridized and thus the carbonyl group is trigonal planar, and if we have attack by a nucleophile, it's going to attack either from above that plane or below that plane, potentially forming uh, chiral centers. And here we can see if we have glucopyranose, it can open up to its aldehyde form, and it is this hydroxyl group uh, that's responsible for this carbon oxygen bond and we see it over here when it goes back it can attack from the same side and then just go back to form our alpha d glucopyranose or it can attack from the other side and that would give us our beta d glucopyranose we see that the oxygen atom this is the oxygen atom that was a carbonyl oxygen in the uh, aldehyde form is has the opposite stereochemistry between alpha d glucopyranose and beta d glucopyranose. So we imagine that the nucleophilic addition to the carbonyl, we could have a strong nucleophile, a negatively charged nucleophile, and it just has a rearrangement of a lone pair of electrons that form a bond between it and the carbonyl carbon. And then we have to promote the, the pi electrons that were in the carbon oxygen pi bond get promoted up onto the oxygen. So we go from sp2 hybridized carbon here to sp3 car hybridized carbon here. This is now a tetrahedral carbon. Uh, we talk about this as being the tetrahedral intermediate. The ultimate fate of this tetrahedral intermediate is dependent on many things. One being uh, what the substituents were on the carbonyl containing compound. Again, we're going to be talking about aldehydes and ketones, so these are carbon and hydrogen. The reaction is of wide scope. It can be done with strong and weak nucleophiles. Uh, we can have strong negatively charged nucleophiles or weak neutral charged nucleophiles. The carbonyl reactivity can be souped up to react with these weak nucleophiles. We'll see in just a second by uh, using the basicity by protonating the carbonyl oxygen. So our, as we mentioned, the carbonyl oxygen can be protonated. When we protonated it, we end up with a positive charge uh, and we can see that that positive charge uh, can be delocalized through resonance and exists on the oxygen and the carbon atoms in this resonance form. So here we see the electrostatic potential maps of uh, acid aldehyde, and you can see a hint of blue in there. That's the carbonyl carbon. You can see that the oxygen uh, has quite a large amount of negative charge character, so it's basic and we can protonate it. When we protonate it, we see the electrostatic potential map over here. Now notice how much more electrophilic the carbonyl carbon is. And of course, this thing is a good acid because we now have a proton over here. The souped up electrophilicity of the carbonyl carbon allows for our uh, carbonyl to be attacked by even weak nucleophiles, weak uh, neutral nucleophiles. And notice that the tetrahedral intermediate, instead of having a negative charge on the oxygen, has a positive charge on the nucleophile in this case. So let's take a look at the reaction uh, variations.
under basic conditions, we have some nucleophile. In this case, we're showing it as a nucleophile with a proton attached. We can use some base. I'm using hydroxide. And we just get an acid-base reaction. The hydroxide will accept that proton. And then the electrons that are between the nucleophile and the hydrogen for that bond reside on the nucleophile. And we now have a negatively charged nucleophile. And our conjugate acid is just water. So. This is the strong nucleophile. It can now attack the carbonyl, as we see down here. Uh, we get our tetrahedral intermediate. There's a full negative charge in the oxygen in this case. And this tetrahedral intermediate, it's an alkoxyl or an alkoxyl-like compound, has a negative charge in the oxygen. That can abstract a hydrogen as a proton from the starting material to regenerate our negatively charged nucleophile. So in this scenario, under basic conditions, we form a negatively charged nucleophile by abstracting hydrogen with the base, but we only need a catalytic amount of base because we either reform the base or the alkoxide can act as our base and pull a proton off. Under acidic conditions, things are a little bit different. We start off with our carbonyl group acting as a base to abstract a hydrogen from our acid and we get the protonated carbonyl compound and now we have a lot of souped up character at the carbonyl carbon it's very electrophilic can be attacked by even a weak nucleophile a weak neutral nucleophile notice down the tetrahedral intermediate when we do this we attack the carbonyl carbon we still uh, this should be coming from the pi bond we still promote a pair of electrons from the pi bond up onto the oxygen uh, and get a hybridization change. We have two lone pairs of electrons on that oxygen now. And our nucleophile now has to carry the positive charge, which had found itself on the oxygen atom. This can be removed by acting as an acid, uh, and it can give up its proton to another carbonyl oxygen on another molecule of the carbonyl group, as we see there, to form uh, another protonated carbonyl compound and our ultimate product. And again, we only need a catalytic amount of acid in the case of uh, looking at these under acidic conditions. In both cases, we have the tetrahedral intermediate. And what happens to that tetrahedral intermediate depends on what's attached to it. In the case of aldehydes and ketones, those are either alkyl groups, it's a, it's a carbon, or a hydrogen, and those are not good leaving groups. The only thing that can leave is the same thing that attacked the nucleophile. Under acidic conditions, the tetrahedral intermediate, this will seek out a proton and protonate at the oxygen. Under acidic conditions, our tetrahedral intermediate has already has a protonated oxygen that's neutral, but it has a protonated nucleophile in this case, and it's going to give up that proton to, so that we both get a tetrahedral group where we've added the nucleophile to the carbonyl carbon, and the proton on the nucleophile is added to the oxygen atom. A couple of things to think about when you're doing any reactions under acidic and or basic conditions. Under acidic conditions, a mechanism will only be reasonable if it avoids the use or formation of a strong base. What we're saying here is that a strong base cannot exist in an acidic environment. On the flip side, under basic conditions, a mechanism will only be reasonable if it avoids the use of formation of strong acids. A strong acid cannot exist in a basic environment. So when we're under a basic environment, you don't want to invoke the hydronium cation as being involved in the reaction. And if you're under acidic conditions, you don't want to invoke use of hydroxide in your reaction mechanism.